Okay, my audio is on. Audio check. Rob, give me an audio check. Check, check, check. All righty. That's the one. Are we, are we good? I think so. And video. Give me one second on the Wait. video. At about the halfway point, we'll do Jack. The, the uh, entry eight. Yep. Okay. Uh, we are live. Tell me when. Jake's just aiming a little low. And. Yep. Let's go. Go. Oh. Hi, folks. Welcome to uh, our Saturday Night Live YouTube workshop in support of our Purple Heart program. We, we have some great announcements. Uh, lots of folks here to thank tonight. I'll do that in between um, answering questions. And we're also, our topic tonight is designing a hall table. Now, that may sound like a strange topic, but hopefully what I'll be able to do is impart some wisdom, information, on how to design a piece of furniture. We're going to focus on a hall table. And I'll show you how I do it, give you some tips and techniques. I studied furniture design under, furniture design under Milo Boffman at Brigham Young University yeah, from 1984, 85 to 1989. And if you don't know who Milo Boffman is, and if you're not in the furniture industry, then you wouldn't. But anyway, he was probably the most prominent U.S. Uh, furniture designer back in the 70s, 80s, yeah, 70s and 80s. Anyway, um, learned a lot, and I got to be his, I, uh, he also hired me to, to work for him, so I would build, he, he was still an active furniture designer and an adjunct professor teaching a couple classes each semester, and I would build his prototype, which was really interesting and challenging and rewarding and great exposure. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, this is also an opportunity for you to participate in our Purple Heart Project. Briefly, it is where we bring in combat wounded veterans from all over the world. Most of them come from the U.S. However, we also bring them from, we've had them in uh, four from Canada, and we had one, Ash, down in Australia. We bring them in for a six-day, very intense, ask anybody who's been in it, hand to a workshop. We start at 7, 7.30 in the morning with breakfast. We're at the bench at 8. We're there until 11 o'clock at night. We do that for six days. We learn all of the basics for building a piece of furniture with hand tools. Everything from sharpening, freehand, to cutting dovetails, cutting mortise and tenon, cutting all of the simpler joints, finishing a board with a hand plane so that you don't have to sand. And um, we ha always have, four, uh, of the 14 students in the class, we always have seven combat wounded veterans who have come in as our guests where we cover their airfare, their hotel, I should say their travel expenses based on my announcement I'm going to make. Travel expenses, hotel, meals, we feed, feed them all three meals right here in our new shop. And uh, we send each vet home with, and if you're talking U.S. dollars, approximately $3,500 worth of premium tools, just exactly what you see me using. And, and this is the one-year anniversary of our bench brigade, thanks to Jack Lane and Chris Chahusky, we and all the many volunteers. We have volunteers now in, I think, four countries or five. And what those volunteers do, to our spec, they procure the materials and build one of our Cosmin workbenches and then deliver it with some really cool personalized stuff on it to each of these vets. To date, mind you, COVID's been an interrupter. To date, we have, I believe, 36. Is that the number, Frick? We've delivered 36 benches. Um, give me a second, actually. Find it for me. Anyway, we're going to give you. A, we're going to have a little uh, slideshow later on in the program, uh, featuring all of these deliveries. It, you'll enjoy it. 31, and 31 benches. 31, 31. Yeah. Sorry. So big shout out to Jack and Chris who have spearheaded this, and I wouldn't have happened. Wouldn't have out have happened without them, and it worked perfectly because of them. So, um, what to wrap this up quickly? What we do tonight, as a service to you, we provide you with uh, information, answers to your questions, and information on the topic suggest the, of the night, which, as I said, tonight is designing furniture, particularly a hall table. And if you would like to participate in some way in showing your support to these men and women who have literally sacrificed their lives 
um, you're able to. You can go to our website, robcosman.com, and when you see it, on the top left, you'll see PHP in the drop-down menu, How Can I Help? And you can go in there and you can offer financial support to whatever amount you want, and that will be spent uh, in some way bringing these folks in and helping them with uh, learning woodworking as a means of what some people call distractive therapy. And you can hear the testimonials. You can go on our, on our YouTube channel and see lots of interviews with those who have had the program. Big shout out to, uh, to Tony Brahador, who is just recently, last week, retired after 27, I think 27 years, Canadian Armed Forces. Tony had um, uh, six or eight uh, uh, combat tours between Afghanistan and Bosnia. And uh, Tony now works here two days a week, and he's helping us spearhead what we're going to do, and I'll announce it in a little bit later. I'm teasing you. We also have Al over here, if you could focus on Al. Al just started working here three weeks ago. Al is also a Canadian combat wounded vet, 20 years, Canadian Army. Started out as a tank driver, you tell me when I'm wrong. Finished off as a tank commander. Um, met up with some, uh, some uh, hairy experiences that involved in a serious explosion by a suicide bomber in a Toyota truck full of propane tanks, but he survived it, thanks to Toyota. One arm has got numerous Toyota parts in it. That's the best way he can tell it. Anyway, he survived, and they came here about uh, two months ago, and we hired him, and he fits in here wonderfully. He's great to have, and his son, Max, is here somewhere. Oh, he's out on the computer. Moose is here with us tonight. Moose is a generous sponsor of, well... Dead cat and moose belong in the same sentence. <laughs> More later. Ken's with us. Megan's here. If you are a combat wounded vet that has been to one of our classes, if you are a combat wounded vet that has been to one of our classes, we would love to acknowledge your presence and give you a shout out. If you will, in the comment section, someone explain it. I never get it right. How do they do it? Press... Type the at symbol, and then start typing Megan, M-E-A-G-A-N, and then it will tag her, and then she can see it a little better. She's also monitoring pretty closely, so she may be able to see it either way. But tell us tell us your name and what class you attended so we can, we can give you a shout-out, and I'd love, to, I'd love to know that you're on there. Excuse me. Frick is behind the... Uh, oh, I should also mention tonight we have a brand-new camera. If only you could see what Jake looks like with this apparatus on. I'll have Moose describe it later. We also have what other new equipment do we have tonight? So, a whole new sound system? Uh, not a whole new sound system. We are using a new camera and new uh, wireless microphones. Okay, so hopefully it's going to improve the experience for you. And I must mention Erica, my, my daughter, who puts on a wonderful meal for us just before we do this. And tonight was fantastic. Oh, Frick is showing it off. We don't all eat those filthy burgers, but... There's potato salad. Any questions? Start off with real quick. Yeah. Give me one. Uh, comes from Mick McGuire. Hi, Mick. In Toonbridge, Vermont. And he says... Oh, Vermont. Beautiful state. There are various ways to attach a tabletop. Which do you prefer and why? Oh, this is really good. Ken, is that pine table here? The, the, the little hall, pine hall table, yeah. Would you see if you... If it is, would you bring it in for me? Um, Mick? From Mick from Vermont? Yes. Mick, I'll show you this because this is the best way ever. I'll wait for Ken. Well, while Ken's out looking for it, go ahead with another one, Frick, please. Uh, okay, this one from uh, Don Erickson in Burlington, Washington. Hi, Don. Rob, instead of the traditional mortise and tenon joinery in table construction, would domino or dowel joinery be adequate? Uh, well... The answer to the question is, have you ever seen a mortise and tenon joint fail in a piece of furniture? And it's rare. Yet everybody has seen dowel joinery fail. And the other thing you said was the domino. Yep. Domino is kind of new. Uh, no, wrong one. Wrong one, sorry. Uh, the, 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 the pine, yeah, that's actually a good one to bring in. But the pine one, I thought, I don't think I took it home. 
Hopefully, it's still here. Is it upstairs? it upstairs? It might be upstairs. You know which one I mean, right? That long one that was kicking around right here? Oh, look. It was right here? Yeah. And that should have uh, been there for a while. It might, it, might, it might have made it upstairs. Hopefully, I'll find it. So, there's, there, I don't think there is any substitute for a mortise and tenon joint in terms of durability, if it's done properly. Uh, I don't think dowels will ever come close, particularly where the joint is going to be stressed. Now, if you look at this as an example, there's a little hall table. If you had, if you had put four dowels in here, there's never going to be any enough, uh, amount, enough stress placed on that, unlike a chair, for it to fail. So I guess the answer to your question as it pertains to this particular piece of furniture, yes, uh, dowels would work, the domino thing would work, not a high stress joint. You talk about a, uh, you talk about a chair. I've got one right here. Max, can I steal this chair from you for a second? Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. This was a this was a prototype I did thirty years ago, and the the amount of stress put on this joint right here, where that stretcher goes into that back leg. <coughs> Everybody that sits on a chair at some point rocks back on it like that. And there's a tremendous amount of force on here. That's no place for a dowel, I don't think. In fact, I could show you, we, uh, we bought a set of, one of the, friend of mine had a dining room set that he was selling, or wanted to sell, with eight chairs. Any of the chairs not have joints broke loose? So with a bunch of men sitting on them for lunch, all of the joints have broken loose. Two chairs have failed that have to be repaired, and it's all dowel joinery. So dowels are taboo for anywhere there's a high-stress joint. That's my opinion based on practical experience. Did we find it, Ken? No. Shoot. Well, you know what? I can show it right here. I can show it here. Okay, so let's go back to the question. Who was it that from Vermont? Mick. Who? Mick. Mick. Mick McGuire. Okay, Mick. So you have a solid wood seat, and this solid wood seat is sitting on a frame. Remember, quick lesson, this leg is not going to get any longer as wood uh, expands and contracts. It's going to get a little bit wider, and it's going to be a, get a little bit wider this way and a little narrower seasonally. But it's not going to change in its length. So this piece is not going to change in its length. This piece that piece and that piece. So if you took the seat off, you would say that this frame is dimensionally stable. It is not going to change. This seat is a solid piece of cherry and it looks to be about 16 inches wide. I think it's a little wider than that. No, it is right on 16 inches. So 16 inches seasonally, could that could easily change a 16th of an inch, maybe even more. I mean, it could get a 16th of an inch wider or narrower depending on the season. So when you attach this seat to this frame, you have to allow for that. If you don't, something will crack. So here's what I did. If you uh, look closely, these are, now this, remember, this was a prototype. I, I would have it a little more refined if it was a finished piece of furniture. So this dowel, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dowels. This dowel is uh, glued to the bottom of the seat. If you can see down there, it's actually been flattened off. Can you see that, Jake? Mm -mm. Can you see right here? Yep. So this dowel has been flattened off. If you, hap if you look real closely, there is a hole, a half-inch hole that's been drilled into this frame. Now, remember, this one's right in the middle. Now, it's not a complete hole. It's, uh, if a complete hole is 360 degrees, I've got about 300 degrees of that hole drilled into there. It doesn't go all the way through. The dowel was put into the hole, and because this one is in the center, it was glued. So that means the dowel was glued into the hole, and the dowel was also glued and screwed to the bottom of the seat. Same thing up here. So nothing's going to move there. However, over here, where the seat has to be attached to this side of the frame, this has to allow for expansion. In fact, if you look real closely, can you see the light ring? Can you see that? You able to pick up on it? Yeah. Okay, so here's this dowel that has been sitting around. 
and UV light has, has made it oxidized. But if you look real closely, there's a little bit of white. So it's winter now, and this seed has shrunk throughout the winter. And in doing so, it's pulled this way. This dowel is screwed to the seat. The 300 degree hole that I have, which is not all the way through, it is not glued to that. So it's what we call a dry fit. Now, be, uh, when I put that dowel into the hole, I would have made sure that there was a little more hole than there was dowel. So I didn't sink the dowel right to the bottom. But because it's 300 degrees of the hole, it's enough to, uh, there's enough coming around on both sides to hold that securely. Because it's screwed to the seat bottom, it's not going to move. But as the seat shrinks like this, these two, which are perfectly centered, are going to cause all of this shrinkage or expansion to go equal from center, meaning it's the same amount is going to move this side as it does move this side. And as it moved, in this case, as it shrunk, that dowel started to pull out of the hole. It still stayed tight, but it pulled out of the hole, keeping the seat tight to the frame. And that's the case with all three on both sides. That is the best way I have found. I actually, I actually uh, can lay claim to that for fastening a solid wood top to a stable frame. And it's easy to do. I've done in other times, I've actually had it come all the way through and used it as a feature where on a light colored frame, you'd have a dark wooden, uh, maybe a walnut dowel and just a little bit of what we would call exposed joinery. Next, Rick. Uh, sorry, Patrick from Germany. Sorry, Patrick. My, my mic is echoing apparently, but. Pac Patrick from Germany? Yes, what is the best construction for a tabletop? Patrick, you're up late. Best construction for a tabletop to avoid warping or cupping, and cupping. Okay, so what, and fits right along with what we're talking about. Uh, we're building, a, we are building some shop cabinets right now in our online workshop. So we're moving into a new shop in the building that's behind us, hopefully soon. We had, ran into a little snag. And we're using pine for all of the cabinetry in there. And these pieces of pine, if you look, can you see that, Jake? See how much that is cupped? Can you see it? Okay. So if I put that down on a flat surface, like so, you can see where it's cupped. But it doesn't take a whole lot of weight to flatten it out. See that? So you can, you can prevent a board from cupping. What you can't prevent is preventing it from expanding or contracting. That's where it has incredible power. So when you're talking cupping, it's not hard at all. In fact, this piece... This piece, as you see, I've already cut the dovetails. When I dovetail this top, which has got a cup on it, to this piece, I'll be able to, you can see how much of a, uh, how much I'm going to have to pull it in order to get it tight. But when that gets driven home, the joint's assembled, that will pull that tight, and that joint will hold it flat so I won't have anything to worry about. As long as you allow for seasonal expansion, it's not difficult at all to prevent wood from cupping. If you've looked at some old, uh, what I would call farm furniture, where they would just have a single board or a couple of boards glued together for a, a cabinet door, they often put a batten on the inside, which is just a straight piece of hardwood, and that was there simply to keep the door straight to prevent it from cupping. Cupping is not a problem. You can always pull out the cup. You can't stop it from expanding. So when we attach the top, I mean, that's a fairly wide piece, that stays nice and flat because of that joint. And of course, you had to have that partial that part of the circle coming wrapping around the dowel, hence the 300 of the 360 degrees. In, and the, why not 360 degrees? Well, I needed some flat part. I needed to flatten part of the dowel in order for it to get a good, good purchase on the inside of the seat. But I still have that part that's coming around, and that prevents it from cupping. That holds it tight to the frame, keeping it nice and flat. So not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. And by the way, solid wood doors, if you think of that as well, over here we've got, uh, there's two doors. I have solid panels 
this one is fielded. This one's not, it's not so, but that solid panel is prevented from cupping because there's a tongue, a narrower tongue cut on the end of it that sits down into a groove inside this rail, top and bottom, and that prevents that from cupping. So not hard at all. Next question, Frick. Uh, Sneaky Pete wanted to know if you Hi, like, Sneaky. like or dislike the bead lock system. The bead lock? Uh, yeah. Wait a second, he said. Sneaky, I don't know. I don't know what the bead lock is. What's wobbly? Is it? Really? I thought it had image stabilization. Sorry, Stinky, I don't know what the bead lock is. Uh, explain it again, and, and uh, we'll go at it a second time. Next one, Frick. Uh, just give me a second here. Okay. Um, <coughs> Grover Briggs in Montana. Is there some kind of standard design ratio between the top and the bottom of a tapered table leg? T table leg. A tapered table leg? Tapered table leg. Tapered table leg. Well, I don't know if there's... Uh, th so this is where we're going to start in the design process. Um, you know, there's all kinds of information. There's, I should say information. There's all kinds of theory on what looks right, what doesn't look right, proper proportions, the golden rectangle, all of that. And I probably at one point studied it. I don't pay any attention to it anymore for the simple reason that you have got to get to a point where you trust your own judgment. In the beginning, that judgment may be questioned, may even be questioned later. But when I, when I do something now, I always do it just by what I think looks right. So when I build a small wooden box, I don't get out my calculator and start multiplying width times height times thickness. I simply hold it in my hand and I just try to envision. Now, I've got to be fair because if you're just new at this, you're saying, well, well, of course, you've got all that experience. So I'm going to try to open that up and help you understand how and why I do it. So I would often, what I'll do is I will set the four pieces, meaning the, the front and the back, actually the front and the back and the two ends, and I'll set them unassembled on my bench. And I'll just put them there and I'll just kind of look at it and say, okay, does it look too long for the width? Does it look too tall? And I'll play around with it and I'll go over and I'll change it a little bit cutting it down on the saw until when I put it there, it just kind of feels right in my hand. Now listen, if you don't start somewhere, you're never going to end up where you want to end up. So you have to take the risk in the beginning and just try it. And then every time you, you may come back to it a year later and look at it and say, oh, that thing was ugly. Well, okay, fine. Try it again. And I always tell people, guys in particular, I said, if you don't, if you're unsure, go check with your wife. They're always better at stuff like this. But... I just do it by feel, get it to where it looks right. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about, how to go about designing this piece of furniture. So his question was on the taper on the leg. Well, if this is a, uh, if you're building a piece of furniture or designing a piece of furniture that's designed to be fairly robust, then you're going to want a robust leg to go along with it. So if this was being built out of a piece of lodgepole pine with, with, uh, what do they call that? What's all that rage today? Live edge. You wouldn't want this spindly little dainty leg holding it up. You'd want this big beefy hunk of lumber standing underneath it. A big beefy hunk of lumber would not look right on this lovely cherry table. So this cherry has an appropriately sized tapered leg. And I'll give you the dimensions. The leg at the top is an inch and three eighths. And the foot at the bottom... I think that's five eighths if I remember. It is. So it's, 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 uh, oh shoot. When did that happen? Ugh. I shouldn't be leaving my furniture around here. It's an inch and three eighths square at the top. It's five eighths square at the bottom. And the taper starts right there. By the way, the reason this is down here is because I, it was been in my house and my kids, uh, younger kids had destroyed it. But because it's solid wood, you can go in and refinish it. So I, I redid the top. It's just in the process of being oiled, and then I'll put it back together. But somebody's dinged it pretty good and knocked a piece. It's still there. I'll have to fix that. I'm trying to think if we've got another tapered leg here anywhere. 
I don't think I have another example to show you right now, but we'll talk about it. So the idea was let's design a, uh, a hall table. So the first thing we've got to think about is what are the parameters? Are there any limitations to the width, to the height, to the, um, to the length? So if it's a hall table and it's designed to go in the hall, halls aren't terribly wide. So the first thing I would think of, okay, this needs to be a relatively narrow table. It can't be half the width of the hall because you'd be running into it constantly. Now, what about height? Well, you don't, I don't think you'd want a hall table up here. You certainly wouldn't want a hall table down here. So I would think of a hall table. In fact, in our situation, a hall table would be stuff that might carry a little bowl that you would keep your keys on. So I would want it to be a height of just right about here, the bottom of my hand. So if I were to measure that, that's bringing me at 29, 30 degrees, which happens to be the typical height of most dining tables, 29 to 30 degrees. So, you, pardon? You keep saying degrees. I do? Twice now. Well, that's not what I meant. They know me. So 30, 30, 29 to 30 degrees is going to be our height. You did it again. <laughs> I did. Yeah, 29 to 30 degrees. He's hearing things. 29 to 30 inches. Yes. You said it again. <laughs> is the height. So that's our first parameter. The second one is the width. Well, okay, take your measuring tape out and start playing with it. Okay, 24 inches? No, way too wide. What's the average width of a hall? I thought about that earlier. 36 inches? No, it wouldn't be just 36. Well, if you were in an apartment. I think code, For your hall, it's only 32? But it's not very wide. So let's, let's, let's exaggerate and say it's four feet. So if you had a four foot wide hall, how much room would you want comfortably in order to easily navigate that hall? And I would say I wouldn't want to be less than 36. So I'm thinking that my hall table probably needs to be somewhere between 12 and maybe we could go 16 inches. I'm thinking 16. Just curious as to what this is. This is 15 and a half. So we're probably going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 16. Now, the next question I would ask is, am I building this for a particular function? Is this designed to hold a piece of art? Is this designed to do anything in particular? Or is it just decorative, just something to fill a spot and collect dust? If it's designed just to fill a spot and collect dust, then you just build it to make it look right. If you have a specific function, if you've got a particular piece of artwork that is going to sit on there, a bowl, a um, bowl, maybe a family Bible, whatever, then it needs to be appropriately sized. You wouldn't want half of the item hanging off the side. So that's going to be a parameter you need to consider. Now, when it comes to lengths, if it's a hall table, then to me, a table would not, I wouldn't want a table to be square, meaning width and, and length the same. I would like it to be a rectangle. And that's where you need to start playing around with, okay, what's gonna actually look right? So what I suggest is this. I like to work with styrofoam. No, oh, it's actually down here. Because styrofoam is inexpensive. It's really easy to, uh, to cut. I can do, I can make changes rapidly. I don't have to worry about ruining it because I can easily buy another piece. And there's no grain to look at. Now, the reason I say that is because, particularly when you first get started, when you first start in woodworking as a novice, you're so thrilled. You look at that piece of redwood and you say, oh, look at that beautiful grain. Well, there's nothing beautiful about that particular grain, trust me. And if you don't see that now, you will in about five years' time. You'll think, well, that's as plain as plain can be. So if we can work with materials that have no grain, then... We're not, being, uh, we're not allowing the wood to overshadow the design. What I mean is this. We want to fill the space with something that is pleasing to look at, and then we can add in the beautiful grain and some of the other subtle features. But we have to have the overall piece filling that spot to be a pleasing form. Now, that brings up the term form and function. So what we just talked about was function. Function is critical. You have to take into account the purpose for the piece. 
Now what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to fit form in with that so that we can allow it to do what it's designed to do, but at the same time make it look right. So I'm going to take this. I, I uh, actually got three pieces of styrofoam. I got an inch. What's up, Al? You look purple. I've got a piece of styrofoam that is inch and a half. I got a piece that's an inch, and I got a piece that's two inch. So, when it comes to the top, I uh, I don't know who said this to me one time, but they said try to stay away from nominal dimensions. Nominal dimensions are inch and a half and three quarter. Everything we buy. Material-wise, sheet goods always come at three-quarter, and uh, if it goes up from three-quarter, it's usually an inch and a half. It just becomes a little stale, a little too standard. So I like to play with something outside of that. Um, so I'm going to go with one inch. Would I, would I think that two inch would fit? Well, it, you could, but if you're going to have a two-inch thick top, then you've got to be prepared to make the rest of it appeal to that heavy top. In this case, I, I want it to be, I want this piece to be a little on the dainty, dainty's not the word. What's the word? Sophisticated, refined. Classic. Huh? Elegant. Elegant. Thank you, Al. Sexy. That's why I knew you came here tonight. Oh, I... I brought him here for a reason. Elegant. I want this to be elegant, and I don't have anything against, um, what would you call furniture that was made out of poles? Where they would just strip the bark off. You see it in in, uh, in the Western states a lot. Cabin furniture would probably be a good way of saying it. There's nothing wrong with cabin furniture. I'm not building. I'm not designing a piece of cabin furniture tonight. So I'm going to keep my proportions a little bit less. So I'm going to take this piece of one inch. And by the way, if you're cutting styrofoam, it has no mass. Cuts well on the table saw, but if you allow the table saw to grab it, it'll. It'll scare the pants off you because it'll jerk it out of your hands. Whereas a big heavy piece of plywood has some mass, this doesn't. You need to be careful. You might even want to use a, a, a bandsaw instead. But as long as you have a splitter on your saw, that'll prevent that stuff from coming back into the blade and throwing it back at you. So I'm going to rip a strip off of this. We'll start. We can always make it smaller. A little hard to make it bigger. I'm going to start by... Uh, this stuff is not terribly flat. I'm going to have to rip it this way. I'm going to start with a piece that is uh, 16 inches. I saying? Take that one out. Let me have this one. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'll go with the extreme first. I don't think I'd want this to be any more than 36 inches. So let's cut it. when you saw me drop that miter gauge that happens to be a piece of junk now I'm not going to trap this just because this stuff doesn't behave very nicely thank you Moose I'll just throw it over there please okay so, get something to hold it at approximately the height we want. That's too low. That's only 24. See, now what we're, just, what we're doing here is we're just trying to envision what this is going to look like. I need something to prop up underneath that just to hold it a little higher. I don't want to use this because it will influence my decision. What have we got here, Ken, that I can... 
Hej. Yes, it is. Thank you. Perfect. All kinds of props. Okay. Now, you have to sometimes, if you look at something like that, if you just kind of squint, and by squinting it takes away the detail, but it just leaves the shape. Now, would that be too big in my hall? Obviously, I'd have, I'd have a def definite place that I'm, think I'm designing this for. Um, not too bad. 16. 16 by 36. It's a, it's a little bit big. I'm going to try 15. Are you sure that's the direction it's big in? Hi. Well, I got more styrofoam. Go. Maybe a little too long. So if I were to envision that against the wall, remember it's a hall table is almost always going to be against the wall, which opens up another possibility we'll talk about in a bit. So if that was against the wall, you'd have to have a pretty good size hall in order for this not to be too intrusive. Um, I'm thinking maybe just a little bit too long. Maybe I just might be looking at that ugly stain. Flip that over so it doesn't bother me. Still looking a little bit big. I'm going to cut it down. I don't need the fence. We haven't even talked about edge work. That's going to change a lot. If you look at this, by putting a bevel on the underside, it, it really elevates it and it lightens it. If you were to see that full thickness of the side, that's a completely different look. But we can change all of that by just edge treatment. I got a question. Yeah? Not me, it's from John. If, uh, let's stop and take questions that are specific to this topic. Well, I didn't prepare those, but John uh, Kasarowski is wondering if you've ever designed like a half, Hi, John. half scale or quarter scale. A scale model. Scale yeah, model. yeah, yeah. Thank you, John, for bringing that up. If I were building something a little more elaborate, I always start with a scale model because a uh, scale model is even quicker because you're dealing with small pieces. But this, I figured, you know what, this is small enough. We can just do the styrofoam thing and, and it'll work. But... A scale model for anything, anything a little more uh, involved, I would definitely start with a scale model. And it has to be to scale. If, as long as it's to scale, it'll look exactly like it does proportionally when it was full size. In fact, when I used trying to earn a living building furniture, this is the reason why it was so difficult, I would start with a scale model. If the client liked the scale model, then I would build a full size mock-up using styrofoam or plywood so that they could put it in the room where it was supposed to go to make sure the last thing you want is to go through the effort of building someone a piece of furniture. You deliver it and they say, she says, oh, that means I don't like it. It's too big. So you would bring in that scale model. I used to take the effort, make, go through the effort of actually drawing in any doors or drawers so they could see exactly what it was going to look like. And then if it was too big, fine, we can cut it down a little bit and make those changes, but not after the piece is finished. Good question. Anything else, Frick, on this? He wants to know why also you are using inches and not metric system since we are in Canada. <laughs> because freedom reigns. Because why? <laughs> well, I lived in the United States from 1980 to 1989, which was essentially the time that Canada converted to the metric system. So I was away. 
Um, but you also grew up using Inti. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that happened. That happened after I left high school. Even if you, even if you hadn't lived in the uni- in the states. Well, here's the truth. How fast do you drive your cut moose? What's the average speed on the highway? What are you thinking? 100 kilometers. 100 kilometers. I don't really think it's taken a long time, but what do you still think? Miles. Yeah. See, Megan, American, still thinks in, in miles per hour. I don't anymore. I actually think kilometers first. Uh, 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 Ken, how much do you weigh? Well, that's a I'm personal ask question. <laughs> ask Megan. Yeah. Less than me. <laughs> how tall am I? No, do you weigh do you weigh yourself in stones, in pounds, and kilos? Pounds. Pounds. I think pounds. I wouldn't, couldn't tell you how many kilos I weigh. So in so here I am there. Now uh, what do you think in fluid? Do you think gallons or do you think liters? Al, what do you think? Liters. Liters? Yeah, I'm liters too. That's kind of been forced upon us. I don't think ki- I don't think do, do any of you think kilos for anything? No, they tried that in Canada. Where's John from? John's from New York, isn't he? I don't know. They tried converting completely over to kilos and grams uh, in meats and things like that, but they, the market forced them to go back and do both. And what's the other one? Lane. What? Yeah, yeah. So in lengths, I I think I don't do meters, so that's why. Interesting question. Next one, Frick. Continue. Yeah, continue. Okay. All right. So here we are back. Now, I'm I'm. Uh, I think I'm okay with this top in terms of its length and its and its width. Now. The next basic question is going to be, how are we going to support it? What are we going to do underneath? This is, uh, this is where I'm, I, uh, I've been thinking about this all week, and I had some really weird ideas. It's so simple. To, it's so common to just stick four legs underneath it with an apron all the way around, and the only variation you really have is the species of wood and maybe a little bit of edge treatment. I thought, what can we do that's a little bit different? Well, I thought, if this is going against a wall, why do we even need legs? We can get away without legs. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to do something that this was attached to the wall, and then underneath it, there was just kind of a V-shaped cabinet that was just a whole bunch of little tiny drawers, because I love making drawers, that kind of tapered back towards, so smaller toward the bottom, and tapered in on the sides, and just uh, tons of little tiny drawers where you could hide Easter eggs or anything else. I thought, well, that would be interesting, but might be a little bit too hard to do in this class and this in this meeting tonight. So then we have to go back to legs, and I thought, well, maybe what we'll do is we'll just show you some different ideas, and then that'll allow you to do it. So let's start off with some legs. Our legs obviously have to maintain the height we want, so. Uh, let's go with, um, I'm going to go 28. I'm going to drop this down to 29. So we want some 28 inch legs and I'm going to use this two inch styrofoam. Uh, I think I'll use the bandsaw to do bandsaw, bandsaw, or this. Uh, I might end up using both for right now. I'm going to start off with this stuff is an inch and seven eighths, so I'm going to go inch and seven eighths square, and then we'll work down from there. So I need 28 inches. How many 28s can I get out of eight feet? 28 and 28, three thirds. I can only get three. I need two strips of this. And by the way, at uh, for Christmas, we're not saying which Christmas. Jake is making Megan a dining room table. Oh, surprise, surprise. 
And that's what this came from because he designed the whole table out of styrofoam. Had he done it, she'd ha had he left it that way, she'd had a table for Christmas. Let that one go out. Okay, I gotta take one more. Jake. Yeah. How many, uh, how many changes were made? Three. Huh? Oh, you mean in the original design phase? Probably three. So doing this is, a, is really advantageous when it comes to cost. Now we'll cut these 28. Didn't trip the breaker, Ken. You surprised? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Don't jinx it. <laughs> okay, so here's our four legs. Now. Easiest way to put them together. Nails, Jake. I don't think there's any up there. Hi. Huh? Alan, can you grab the nails under, right underneath the marking gauges? I, I, I can use the, I can use these. Are they long enough? Are you using screws? Well, yeah, haven't we got some really long ones? No, uh, yeah, I got them, yeah, I do, right here, right here. Where do we, uh, where do we get the styrofoam from? Um, RobCosm.com. <laughs> the styrofoam? Yeah. Any building, any uh, okay, any home center piece. will have styrofoam. It's what they use for insulation. I, I got it. I got what you need, Al. I was going to screw these in, but I haven't got a screwdriver. Because you stole it. Now, first question is, and this is going to change a lot too. Do we want the legs? Just go ahead and put this in place. Uh, I'll be here all night if I do that. <clears throat> yeah. Just grab a drill. Uh, driver with a bit. How is the uh, styrofoam on the shooting board? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say Super Dave can handle it. Was that? Yeah. Uh, we actually had Super Dave. That's how he started. Styrofoam on the shooting board. Actually. Who's asking Dave, these? When Dave came to the class, all of his wood... We had taken styrofoam and painted it to look like pine so that he could learn appropriately. Where is he? He's not on? It's not fun to make fun of him. Uh -huh. I thought he was You're on. wasting all these. Um, we that can do vets. Oh, oh good. Please, who? Uh, Doc Bailey. Hey, Doc. Uh, Vietnam. Doc was a... Uh, Attached to the Marines, he was a corpsman. Uh, Ray Dor. And my buddy Ray Dor, Vietnam as well, raised down in Louisiana. And, and uh, Ray drove a mule. A mule. Check out, check out U.S. Army Vietnam era mule. So you can see what that is. Uh, Paul is on. Paul, Paul from Paul from Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Hi, Paul. Paul is uh, Lieutenant Commander Paul, Canadian Navy. Just got back from Australia, where he'd been for a year. Charlie Ray. Ah, uh, Charlie, salt of the earth. Charlie Ray, Vietnam. Mark. Is Multiple on. purple hearts. Mark Smith. Mark Smith, who's soon to leave us, going to Ontario. Why he would trade on? Well, I know he's going up to help his dad. Admirable. And then Philip Lawrence. Wish you all the best, Mark. Who? Phil Lawrence. Yeah. Hello, Philip. Phil's Phil's Navy as well, right? Wasn't Phil Navy? I hate to be. Wrong. No, Phil. Um, Phil Lawton was Navy. Phil. Okay. 
Phil, tell me what tell me what branch to service so I can. Okay, this is ugly. So we look at that and we think, my goodness. But we got to start somewhere. So what's wrong with it? Well, number one, I don't think I want my legs out flush from there. So the first thing I'm going to do is come in here and bring these in. Best thing about this styrofoam, it never splits. So where are we going to put that? If I was going to go with a leg this size, I would bring that in a little bit. And that, as soon as you do that, that instantly changes the look and it lightens it. Do they know what you mean when you say lightens? Lightens it? Um, good question. Uh, lightens it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll use the word, if you look down here, this has a tendency to almost look bulky. And this has a tendency, it's almost like, it may sound a little bit fruity when I say this, but it's almost like the legs are presenting this beautiful piece of wood for you to admire. It's kind of elevating, holding it on a platter. So the legs are, oh, this is really crazy, but the legs become subservient to the top. How's that for Archie Fartsy 101? Right? The legs are kind of pulling in. They don't want to be part of it. They're just there to present this beautiful piece of wood, which would allow me to make, a, make this top out of something absolutely stellar. Let me pull this one in as well. Now. Kevin we, Burris is on. Hi, Kev. He says Super Dave must be riding his tractor, pimping out his tractor. <laughs> so Kev, Kevin Burris who is uh, one of my favorite guys. Kevin was, uh, I think, 27 years EOD. That stands for Explosive Ordnance Disposal. That means he was out there, and he was the front line of protection for the men in his, in his um, uh, squad. He would dismantle, attempt to dismantle, various forms of IEDs and explosives. He endured hundreds of them, which is how he ended up becoming a collector of Purple Hearts. On the brighter side, Kev introduced us to the wax that we now, which is now our number one selling product. So if you have a hand plane and you don't have this magic wax, you got to get it because it makes hand planing so much easier. Uh, Kevin's Phil just a great Lawrence guy. Army. Phil Lawrence's army. Thank you, Phil. All right. So, Did that? So, what kind of finish do you use on styrofoam? Fin uh, <laughs> who's asking these questions? They're, they're it looks quite. Like a IKEA table. I, what? Yeah, it looks like an IKEA table. IKEA table. We just we're just we're this is we're fifteen minutes in. Who's asking these questions? Well, Daniel asked that one. Daniel Gang. We also want to oh, know Daniel! If we're auctioning it off tonight. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm just gonna give it to him. <laughs> All right, now watch what watch what. Let, let's just see what's gonna happen. So we're gonna go from looking at we, we haven't even put any shape into these legs. We're gonna go from looking at it like this to looking at it like this. Does that change it for you? It does a whole lot for you, right? We're moving in the right direction. It did a whole lot for Frank. Yeah. Very moved. Yeah. You poor people that have no interest in woodwork and furniture design are having to endure this tonight. Every, um, every Saturday. Every other Saturday. <laughs> every other Saturday. Every other Saturday. Okay, so now, now I sit and look at this. We, we haven't even gone in with our aprons yet. We've got to do something. I'm trying to figure out how, what can we do to make this a little less man, mundane. Um, well, that gap in the middle is too... Yeah, it's great. too obvious. So let's go in and let's go in and well, put a, and put an apron in there. Well, and we have lots of options with the apron. I thought you wanted to avoid not using avoid using an apron. No, I no, I no, I no, no, I'm not trying to avoid well, using an apron. Try pulling the legs in a little bit more. No, toward each other. In Likewise, this way? Yeah. And having more hanging out over the air? Yeah. What's your reasoning? S shrinking that gap because that gap looks really bad. No, no, I don't I know. I don't uh if I, I, if, if this was um, live edge, then yes, I would put one big slab of wood 
just being held by four legs. But this needs to have more than that. This needs to have an apron, and we can do some stuff with the apron. So let's go and make an apron. Uh, let's just get an approximate on here. So 28 and a half. I'll use the one inch material. We'll start off with six inches and come down from there. So 28 and a half, right? Where is that one inch piece? Uh, they've asked me to sit on it and see if it can. They've asked you to what? <laughs> <laughs> sit on it. See if it can hold a naughty girl. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty-eight and a half. That's a lot of pressure here. Uh -huh. What? Didn't we say twenty-eight and a half? I didn't realize you measured it. Huh? I didn't realize you measured it. Yeah, I did. Twenty-eight and a half. Now, I'm going to use, uh, I'll just use some finished nails on this. Uh, where are we in time? Uh, we're exactly halfway through. Oh, are we? Okay. Well, I, I, what's our numbers? What are our numbers? 700. Okay. I want to stop and do some, uh, do some stuff. We have a bid for $1.50 for the table. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but shipping's too. You hard. guys are testing me. He sells these for eight hundred, so it's gonna have to get higher than that. Okay, we can actually just leave that there for Matt. That changes the look. Still bulky, but we can do a lot with it. We can come in and we do something with the leg. We could possibly put an arc. Just a nice arc underneath here, which would, which would lighten it. I might actually try that. That would be something a little bit different, which might also open up some possibilities for a drawer. Hold that thought. Uh, so let me tell you what we're giving away tonight. We have uh, lots of seconds. So we produce in here about 50% of all the stuff that we sell. So here's a mallet. So... The screw broke off when we were doing the, the, what we do is we put the screw in between the uh, handle and the head and the threads are in, in both and that keeps from coming off. So we can't sell that. So that would go as a second. Just pull out another one. You're selling these or this is part of the draw? This is, this is the draw. Oh, this one, this is nothing wrong with this at all, but this is cherry. So we tried some resin impregnated cherry, but uh, it's not part of our regular inventory. So we can't really sell it. It's too, too awkward to try to make a whole new page on the website. So we've got a couple of cherry mallets. Actually, I'll set them out like this. And we're going to give away a drawing for one for a prize at every $500 increment instead of 1000 tonight. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell this. Santa Claus, who is the, our, our huge supporter in all this, has COVID. Now, Mrs. Claus just recovered from it. Santa got it. I think he's got the, best, the worst of it behind him. So you need to remember him in your prayers. That, that man has been unbelievably generous in his support for what we do and for the vets. He's a Vietnam vet himself. So Santa, we're thinking of you, brother. Uh, we're all, we also have lots of Kerfex 10s. And these are seconds as well. I'll just pull one out to show you. Okay, so here's what happened. There's a bit of a gap right there, but it'll still work perfectly. So that's what we're going to draw for tonight. We're also going to draw for this. So if you saw, we just recently re released a YouTube on... This will be the grand. Yeah, uh, or YouTube on doing, uh, making a flat miter. So this, this is one that we, this is the one that we actually did. It was on making a picture frame. A picture frame, yeah, sorry. So we're going to give this away tonight as well. That's a catalog out of um, Lee Nelson back, oh my, several years ago, 2003, I think, or two. And I, I they'd asked me to make the... Uh, the prop for it. So that's, I had made that dovetail. So I thought, well, what the heck, we'll frame it. You're going to sign it, I assume. Yes, we'll sign it and date it. Yep. Okay, so those are the prizes for tonight. So 
You don't have to donate in order to enter in for the draw. The link is there. Enter in, and we'll draw your names. Plus, we're also, thank you to Moose, tonight we're giving away the famous dead cat, which I have to tell you something about the dead cat. It's kind of a name that uh, not everybody likes, but it's, it's part of us. It is the warmest garment and the lightest, and for a cool spring day, it's fantastic because it doesn't weigh anything. You hardly even know it's on. Over there modeling it would be the moose himself. <laughs> now, I do believe we got, we got something special coming. We've been working on this for how long? You want to tell the story? Because somebody, somebody really stepped up to the plate. Yeah. Grab the mic, moose. The mic's on. Yeah, my, uh, uh, my rep, who I've been buying clothing from for many years, great guy, good friend. Uh, when I explained what I wanted to do, he was willing to uh, eat the production costs for getting uh, a logo for Purple Heart produced to go on our sweater. So that's in the works now, and uh, thanks to John Daphne from Nova Scotia who worked with us and uh, through a number of iterations to get it just right. And uh, I think Frick has a image he can put up there now. It's up. That shows uh, the lovely job he did. The order's already been placed. We expect to have them shipped on the 22nd. We should have them online for you guys uh, by the 27th. So we'll be able to feature it on our next live, but you'll be able to find it. That's at Pat's Secret Garden. So we have lots of the original dead cat, and Moose is offering... Well, first of all, we're going to draw tonight. We're going to give away the Captain's Always Right hoodie. We're going to give away the dead cat to some lucky person. We're going to give away the, the infamous naughty girl, and we're also going to give away... The cat. I've been wearing this all week, and it's. I. Uh, I think. I, I think it's great. It's one of my favorites. So, plus, Moose is offering for sale on sale the dead cat. Existing ones. Yeah. At how much? At uh, the regular forty-eight online, they're going on for thirty-five. Do you want to get closer to the mic? When, yeah. Yeah, they're they're regular forty-eight uh, on for thirty-five for this week, before the. New, Before we switch to the new stock ones. comes in, and we'll be going. Uh, we'll still carry both, but uh, I'm sure there's going to be lots of interest in the. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a really straight. nice, really nice looking garment. Everyone and just wants a, an explanation on the dead cat. Who does? People who. Okay, well, so if you've never heard of, well, it's called I don't the even know. Frick. I don't step even up know to the plate on this. So I was asking Moose one day. I said, Moose. What do you have that we can, because we're always looking for something interesting to give away. We want to show our appreciation to you guys. And he said, Rob, he said, I've got this sweater. He said, he said, when little kids come walking, now you have to understand, Moose and his wife, Pat, have the center stall in the, uh, the uh, market in St. John, New Brunswick. This is the oldest. The oldest continuing farmer's market in the country. Right. So this building. I was there when it was built. <laughs> and it's there. So the building looks like a turn upside down ship. St. John was a shipbuilding port. Do a little research on this. We have the highest tides in the world, so it was it was a, a natural for uh, a dry dock. Literally, it could be the dry dock could be filled without any expense. Close the gates at high tide, the water goes away, and now you've got uh, a tub full of water that you can have a boat in, or you, actually you can do that to bring the boat in. At low tide, you let the water out, close the gates. And now you're high and dry. Anyway, um, so this market was built 100 and how many years ago? 145 or... 145 years ago. And it's on a slope, so, so Moose spends his entire day sideways standing on this slope. Anyway, he said, so whenever the kids come by, he said, the kids will come over and they'll just hug the sweater. He says, it's like, it's like cuddling a big fluffy cat. And then Frick morphed that into a dead cat somehow with his twisted sense of humor. I don't think I did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you did. Yeah, we know you did. <laughs> so it became known as the dead cat sweater. You don't have to call it that, we do. So that's what we're giving away tonight. And... It's funny when I wear it that they don't grab it. And uh, it. I, I don't know what's going on. There. <laughs> yeah. Could be the fact that you were around when the place was built. <laughs> <laughs> You've lost your allure. Um, so now I want to take a break, and I want to uh, 
T-shirts, yes. So uh, if you look over here real quick on my calendar, this is Angie. Angie is Ken's cousin. Angie is at home, anxiously awaiting. She's got her own locker here now. And soon she'll be joining us here in the shop, as soon as she's able to. And she and her sister, Lynn, package up all of our T-shirts. So if you want to wear and promote our Purple Heart Project, you have an option of three different... I don't want to sound this. I don't want to make this sound like a big infomercial, but this part of it is. So teal, that was Angie's color, and you can see that she does all the packaging, and she signs it with her initial, so you know that it's been properly QC'd. That stands for quality control. We have our military green. This one says wood for good on the back. Our original says wood is good, thanks to Kramer, and this one says wood doing good, thanks to my. My uh, niece, Michaela, who came up with that slogan. Now, a hundred, uh, hundred years ago, I've got to get that out of my head. Uh, one year ago, Jack Lane volunteered to handle this thing called the Bench Brigade, where uh, civilian volunteers, actually not necessarily civilian volunteers, because we've had several vets that have been in our class turn around and make a uh, bench for another vet. So these guys build the bench, they pay for the materials, we provide them with the vice and the bench dogs and the plans. They build it per spec. And then uh, Jack organizes all of this and uh, makes the arrangement so that they can deliver it in person and have that one-on-one -on -one connection with the vet who has been to our class. And this allows these uh, wounded warriors to go home and continue what we've taught them here. It becomes their therapy. Uh, I don't know anything about this. I'm a woodworker. I just because of Jesse Paratus, who said to me, and the phrase that changed my life was, he said, ever since he got involved in hand tool woodworking, it was the first time he found any peace from the physical and the mental pain that he suffers from. And that struck a chord that uh, thanks to Santa Claus and uh, Colonel Luther and uh, all these other people around me that help, that has put us on this course where our mission is to bring peace and joy into the lives of these heroes through something as simple as hand tool woodworking. So we provide them with the tools and the training. These civilian volunteers, part of the bench brigade, provide them with a bench that they can work on. And Frick has put together a, uh, a slideshow that is, I'm going to go over there and watch it, featuring a picture of each bench, each of the 31 benches that to date. Now, not all of them. Not all of them? We weren't how, many, able to, how many did we get? I think uh, probably half of that. Half? Shoot. But we'll go for the other half next time. Jack and I just kind of came up with this idea a matter of a couple of days ago. It's spur of the moment. But you'll get, you'll get a little flair for it. Uh, I'm not calling out for volunteers right now because we've got almost more than we can handle. But if you really want to, contact me. There's already been some people in the chat uh, offer their services to Jack. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Probably more after this. If it hadn't have been for COVID, we'd have had a whole lot more of this done, but uh, we're full steam ahead. And I got a big announcement right after this. Hey, hey everybody, Frick here from the Rob Cosman team. This month marks the one year anniversary of the PHP Bench Brigade. We'd like to thank Jack Lane for spearheading this project and helping these deserving vets get the bench they need to continue their woodworking. Our first bench was delivered to Chris Kosum and was built by Rick Schmid in Houston, Texas. We would like to recognize Rick and Chris Shahusky. Chris has been responsible for shipping most of these benches, and Rick has designed the crate that we use to get them shipped. He is also responsible for building the most benches at three. Here we have Bench Brigade volunteer Justin Bernhoff with PHP vet Dan Fye. Next, we have Brett Lawler, PHP vet, with his bench. Brett's bench was built by Bud Mormon and Mark Menke, seen here in this picture. Next up is Eric Eberhard, commonly known to the group as Ebby, with his bench. Here is PHP alumni Jace Badia with his bench, as well as Jeremy Brees with his bench. Here is PHP vet Phil Lawrence with his family and Ken Stewart, who built his bench. Next up, we have Kevin Burris, and his bench was built by Andrew Peterson and his crew. This is Phil Gustafson and Bench Brigade volunteer Mike Bailey. And here is Phil with his beautiful bench. Next up, we have PHP vet Kevin Smira and Bench Brigade volunteer Adrian Abshire on the right. 
And then this is Rich Campbell, who is the builder, and PHP vet Phil Lawton. With his extra tall bench, this is PHP Canadian vet Josh Briand with the volunteer David Anderson. Here is PHP vet Rob White and bench brigade builder Walt Washburn. This is bench brigade volunteer and UPS pilot Jeff Church, who built Zach Clayton's bench and got UPS to fly it to him in Maui, Hawaii. Here is Zach with his bench. Our next bench is from Derek Holden, who built it with the help of PHP supporter Charlie Ray. And finally, this is Dan McGinnis with his bench. At this time, we'd like to give a special shout out to Josh Faust, who made dozens of these plaques for our heroes and put them on the front of their bench. On behalf of Rob, Jake, Colonel Luther, Jacqueline, and the rest of the team, thank you so much to everyone who has volunteered their time to help get these vets the benches they need to continue their woodworking and their healing process. Happy anniversary. Okay, we're ready? Okay, so here's the announcement. We've been anxiously waiting to get our back working. We've got a brand new shop that we uh, are almost ready. It's going to be, uh, how big is it, Ken? Huh? You know, we play in it. How, how big? So the actual shop is 56 feet by 34. Jake, the Jake went nuts on the lighting, so... I mean, literally, you will get a tan in there. It's airy. We've got in. We put in air conditioners and heating. Uh, a nice solid flat floor, which is a bonus. Yes, the floor is flat. Yeah, it's flat. We have a quiet room in the. So in the back of the shop, there'll be a quiet room for those uh, who have had uh, negative effects of of uh, TBIs. We've got two bathrooms. We'll have a full kitchen. We have a mash dining hall. And we are now, because the uh, COVID situation has been relaxed in Canada, don't get too excited, we, they have opened up what's called the Atlantic Bubble. Stupid terminology. I can't believe I'm having to repeat it. I hate acknowledging this stuff. Anyway, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland are part of this uh, union of four Atlantic provinces that can now travel unrestricted. Prior to that... In fact, even right now, if I were to go to any one of those provinces, upon return, I would have to self-quarantine for 14 days, meaning I couldn't, be, I couldn't go out of my house. Upon arrival? Upon arrival. And return. And return. Well, whatever. You get the picture. That's going to be lifted April 19th. So we have opened up our first PHP workshop in uh, a year. Year and a half, that's right, too, because our last one would have been the fall of 2019. And the date is going to be May 20, May 24th through to, that's a Monday, through to a Saturday. So the same schedule. If you, in order to qualify, you have to, ma you have to have maintain a residence in one of those four provinces. Doesn't matter where you're from, as long as you live in one of those four provinces. There are seven civilian spots available. There are seven spots for combat wounded vets. The combat wounded vets need to go through the same selection process, which will go live again on our site in the next 24 to 72 hours. Watch for it. The link will be on there. And uh, I, I encourage any combat wounded vet. Here's the stipulation. You must have received an injury, whether it be a mental or a physical injury, on a combat tour. And uh, if, that, if you fit there, please apply. Um, uh, what more can I tell you? There's tons of information on the website. The only thing that doesn't apply on the website would be anything that would involve outside of the provinces. So that, that schedule will be, ma will be maintained. If you're a combat wounded vet, remember, we will take care of your transportation to and from. We will house you while you're here in the local hotel, which I have to give them a shout out, uh, Travel Lodge has been incredibly generous to us. The rates that they give us for the vets is phenomenal. They give us a fantastic rate for the civilians. So I would encourage you, if you come, stay there. We will book the rooms and have them held. Uh, that's where we stay. That's only about a 12-minute drive from the shop. We will provide breakfast, lunch, and dinner right here in our, in our new kitchen and in the mash dining hall. 
We'll run the class from 8 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. We've expanded what we're going to teach you because we added an extra day. It will be awesome. If you are a, uh, if you are a civilian or uh, a vet that's able to pay and you're not, you don't fit into the combat wounded uh, category, you're welcome to, uh, it's a first come first serve on those seven spots. I think two have already been filled, but uh, don't let that discourage you. You forgot, the, we, you forgot the best part. You? The food. The food. Oh, I'm getting there. Hold on. Oh. So, um, yes, apply. What are we doing? If, if, they, if, if the, you want a civilian spot, email. email, thank you. I just needed some help. Email support at robcosman.com. And Dean will forward that to me, and I will contact you. We'll make the arrangements. Uh, when, and Yeah. What else? The food. They come for the training. They go home 10 pounds heavier, even though we worked them hard. The food is fantastic. We appreciate you men and women in arms, in, in a service to our country, and we, will, we give you the very best that we can find. We have incredible food. I go to those things for the food. The, uh, the woodworking will be second to none, but the experience of being there in their company, I mean the combat wounded vets, will change your life. Ask anybody who has attended. So that is the announcement, and if there's enough of a response, we'll do it again. And we'll keep doing it until we can open up our borders with the U.S. and we can resume. Unfortunately, that's not available to us yet. We have no control over that. We've not been given any direction. We have no idea. There's all kinds of rumors out there, but we have no idea. So this, we know we can do. We're doing it. Go. They will be missing out. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, you know what? That is... Um, that will be the only sad part. We won't get to have Luthy. I must bring them into the picture. No pun intended. Brothers from different mothers. This is Luther. This is Super David Benson. Luther is a retired U.S. Army Colonel, artillery. Super Dave Benson. A tractor driver. <laughs> now a tractor driver. Often seen circling his house endlessly. <laughs> He, uh, 17 years total, half it in the Navy, scuba diving in Cuba. Then he felt guilty, so he joined the Army and did some real work, and uh, as a result was wounded in Afghanistan. What, where did, uh, what part of Afghanistan did Super Dave serve in? Uh, he was in uh, Kandahar province. Just outside, uh... Can they hear him? No. Super Dave was in Kandahar, Kandahar, Kandahar. Yeah, Azi Badad? Azi Badad. Rough place. That's Super Dave. And he, we, we name him Super Dave because of his characteristics. He is super. Um, we have, we have the, the bunch of us have an absolute blast. It is a memorable experience. Ken participated. Ken was in our class. Last class we did? No. One before. So he'll tell you. Danny and Gary Burnett are both on. Danny Bell? Mm -hmm. And Gary Burnett. Danny Bell, shouldn't you be in the shop building a table? <laughs> and Gary Burnett, Gary's always there. Gary, brother. Gary, Gary's nice to have you. Danny, Anybody else? Danny said that uh, changed his life. 2018, he was in the class. October 2018 changed my life. He also <laughs> changed his memory. <laughs> he also said Luther wanted to be a pilot, but changed his mind. <laughs> Those, uh, yeah, well, okay, we won't touch that. Anything else? Am I forgetting anything? We got the prizes covered. We got the t-shirts. We got the dead cat. I'm thinking, I'm thinking there's something. We got, the, we got the bench brigades part covered. Am I forgetting anything? Angie. Oh, thank you. Yes. So, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I got lots of stuff here. Look at this. Oh, this is this, this. Is highly coveted. So do you know what that is? Does anybody know what that is? Come on, Al. Now that's a T and an O. 
That is the patch of the tough hombres. And if you saw our episode with Herman DeMio, Herman is uh, 90, just had his birthday. How old was Herman? 96? 96 year old, World War II vet, uh, D Day plus four, Utah Beach, fought across the uh, hedgerows of northern France, captured by the Germans, spent the last year of the war as a POW. And his son, John, thankfully, sent me this patch to go on my Tony Brahadur, who takes care of my, my uh, apron, will sew that on for me. And uh, they mailed it to me on January 6th, and it arrived March, March 14th. Newman delivered it himself. Thank you. Thank you, John. Now, recently in the mail, I also received... I also received this, and this came from um, Braden, who is 10, I think he's 10, yeah, 10 years old, and Braden, you did a, an incredible job. So this is made out of, uh, was this teak? No, mahogany. And he cut that out, that's a maple leaf, and that's actually very well done. And Braden, I appreciate your note, and this will find a spot right up here on my bench. Behind my bench. Thank you. Was there something else? Nope. I think we, we covered that. That was my, uh, that was my, yes, Christmas cards. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. Now we're back to work. Question? No question? Uh, yeah, one that was asked earlier in the chat from. Uh, Go ahead. Dave Come on, I got to salvage this thing. Dave Bond from France. He says, can you explain the process for arranging boards to make a tabletop to avoid cupping and making it easy to plane? Yes, I can, Dave. First of all, it's very old. Jake, can we take a walk down back? I don't know if the audio will work. Well, well, they're brand new mics. be a bumpy ride down there, too. So, the old, uh, the old way of doing it. Just a second. Are we still are we still connected? Yeah. If you Mike's are line Mike's are line of sight with what? I got you. Okay. What are you aiming at me that you got me? Whatever. I'm aiming the receiver. Way of thinking. No, I don't got you. What? I don't got you. Is it because of that thing? Tell me if I'm back on. You are, but As I was saying, the old way of doing it was if you wanted a wide panel to stay flat, that they told you that you had to take it, take your boards, rip them into small, narrow pieces, and then glue them back together, flipping the annual rings. And the idea was that instead of giving a big cup like this, that, it, that the uh, one would cup this way, the next would cup that way, and it would even out and give you more of a washboard effect, which I don't know why you'd want that. But here's a beautiful piece of uh, fiddleback maple that they've destroyed. I bought a whole bunch of this lumber at an auction at a furniture factory that went out of business. I had, uh, I, had uh, I don't know how many of these panels. But they took beautiful bird's eye, and in this case, curly maple, and they ripped it all up into these narrow strips, which I think is absolutely ugly. You don't need to do that. We live in homes that are, have central air conditioning a lot, control the humidity. There's not wild fluctuations like there used to be in older homes. So you don't have to worry about that. You can easily prevent wood from cupping. You cannot stop it from expanding and contracting. Remember that. We have to build around it. But you don't have to worry about it cupping. That can easily be dealt with, whether it's a frame that goes all the way around, whether it's a dovetailed corner, whether it's the way I showed the dowel method of holding it to a stable frame, battens if you like, as long as you allow for the expansion, no problem. It does not take any effort, any amount of effort to flatten out a board. What was the rest of his question? Um, he said, could you explain the process for arranging boards to make a tabletop to avoid cupping and make oh. it easy to plane? Okay, so here's the other thing. So uh, if you were, and I did this, uh, I built a dining room table for us not that long ago. 
and the table is 10 feet long by 42 inches wide, I think. And it probably has five boards in it. So that's a big job if you're going to try to hand plane it. And over on a, on a 10 foot board, the grain may change direction numerous times. So what I preferred to do was to hand plane each board independently. And then I knew that this board was best planed left, uh, right to left. And I would label it as such. So the top surface would be smooth. And then I would do the next board. So when I glued the two of them together, I already determined which direction was going to be best to plane. So this one and the next one and the next and the next. So all of my planing could be done in that same direction. But the fact that I had pre-planed them before I assembled them meant that as long as I was able to get my glue joint as close to flush as possible, and I would only glue up one at a time, then once it was all done, I merely had to take my smoother in and just clean up the glue joint. And it doesn't take much to glue up accurately without any kind of an indexing method, whether it be dowels or a spline. You simply start on one end and you have somebody else on the other end and they're lifting or lowering a board as you go along with your clamps, checking the feel with your finger and do one at a time until you end up having the entire thing glued up and everything is nice and flush. That's the best way to do it. Pre-plane so you know which way. That really comes in handy, by the way, when I build a bench. So when I built my bench, this center core, which is hard maple, is three inches thick. So it's made up out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces. So I went in and I planed the top edge of each one of these so they were smooth and square. And I labeled them with an arrow, knowing you plane that way. So when I glued them together, all of the pieces were planed in the same direction, which really... Uh, by the way, when we glued that together, we put splines in there and double, double splines, right? Two splines on, on each face so that there was, that was almost perfect. You just literally had to wipe off the glue squeeze well, out. Aside from the fact that the middle one's longer. You didn't have to tell them that. <laughs> it's important to label. Yes, and pay attention to your labels. Anyway, so in future sur resurfacings, as long as you go that one way, everything's going to work out and you'll live happily ever after. Next question. Good question, by the way. It's 8.30. It's 8.30? Okay. We'll go back to work? Yes. All right. So let's look at this thing. Uh, Ken, any ideas? You're still awake? <laughs> the apron's too wide. Yeah, the apron is too wide. So let's, let's try something. I don't quite know if it's... In. Actually, what I'd like to do, I'd, I'd like to do before I do anything is let's do a little bit of work on the leg. Uh, we're not going to have time to, to, I mean, this, if I was building this, if I decided that I wanted to do it, this might go on for two or three weeks. And I, and don't be in a hurry. Him, uh, guaranteed. So what I might do is I might just leave it, let it sit there for a while. And I'd, I'd see it multiple times a day and I'd think about it and I'd come back and say, let's try this, let's try that. And uh, eventually I would get what I want. So what I'm going to do next is let's go in and uh, play around with the leg. And there's lots of things that we can do. We can taper it on four sides. We can taper it on two sides. We can taper it toward the inside. We can taper it toward the outside. I... I uh, Oh yeah, when we when one of the projects that I recently completed was the standing desk, and it had four legs, but it was a, a desk, which had uh, the bulk of the desk was on the top, obviously, and I, it just warranted legs with no taper. All we did was just break the corners, and it looked right for that. As I showed you over here, this wouldn't. This needed to have some taper. Now. The other, thing, the other thing I would look at this too, and I said, that probably is a little bit too heavy. I got I to gotta keep this apron in because this, this dramatically changes the look. I had a, I had, there, there, there. This changes the look enough that I want to keep that in there. And this is something too you can play around with. That, that apron can be brought right out here out in the front, so it's flush with the, with the, uh, with the leg or it can be set back in. It could be way in so the leg is very prominent. Lots of stuff that you can do. I'm just gonna push that in there. All 
All right, we'll just leave that on there for a minute. I'm going to try taking this down. So right now that's inch and seven eighths. I'm going to go inch and five eighths. Wait a minute now. Yeah, I'm going to go inch and five eighths. And see what that looks like. Okay, now without doing anything else other than changing, changing the dimension of the leg. Does that do anything for it? I think so. In fact, when I look at that now, I, I think Jake was right. I think the, uh, I think the, uh, I think the, ape, the top needs to go over farther. I would pull that in another three quarters of an inch maybe. But I also think that that leg, so uh, what I'm trying to do is, is help you look at something and realize it. When you look at this, does that look excessively bulky? And do you notice that this much looks more refined? Do you see that? I'm waiting for an answer. Uh, I'm trying to get away from the school desk look which is what this is starting to lose, starting to remind me of. But let's, uh, let's try something else since we're a little short on time. I'm going to go in and I'm going to apply a... Uh, I'm going to apply... No, not a taper to the leg. I'm going to leave the leg because I'm, I'm thinking the leg might be all right the way it is. But I'm going to go in and I'm going to play around with some bevels on the underside of the top and see what that does. Frick, you fire questions at me if they come up. Yeah. Can we still give it away? They'd have to assemble it anyway. After yes. Shipping. All right, let's, uh, did you ever get me that marker? Most people like the thinner leg. Like the what? The thinner leg. Yeah, uh, that, was, that was quite noticeable. And I, like I said, I think we could even get it with it being square. So I'm going to start, I'm going to start with a 45 degree bevel and see what you think of it. What's the matter? Because it won't go over 45? Is there another uh, insert that will? I'm not sure to go 45. This foot is... It's a knuckle buster. Okay, we'll do this. Start over here a little farther away first. Let's, uh, let's do an end, a long face and an end first. We should have actually put these pieces all together so we could have dropped this back on. Now, does that do anything for you? It doesn't do anything for me. Still too. And I, it's still too bulky. 
I'm going to take a, what? No, that, the 45 isn't working, but I'm going to, I'm going to take a little more to light, to thin that up a little bit and see what that does. Now, if I wanted to lighten that even more, it's funny because you really don't see anything underneath here. All you really see is this. But I think what I want is I want to stretch this out. So I want to pull this bevel back. This, again, remember what I said? You try to stay away from the mundane Three quarter, inch and a half. 45. 45. 45 is too mundane. So let's, let's, uh, let's drop that. Let's try 30. So that's going to pull that bevel back. I don't particularly like cutting styrofoam. It lifted. Huh? It lifted up. That's, it didn't get an even cut. As long as I have my corner. It's not particularly even. I could live with that. Dad. What? Frick has a question for you. I don't. Someone took over. Oh, yeah? Our guest. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Are you bringing those down to inch? Yeah, I'm going to bring these all down to keep me, keep me on the time. That would be uh, McLaren, youngest of five grandsons. Lover of uh, maple butter. Well, I, I don't, I, I, uh, if you're gonna do this, cut several, make sure you have your splitter in. I had to take it out because this throat plate won't allow for the splitter when that blade is over at 45 degrees. He doesn't like losing his job. Hey, you can be replaced. Fired even. All right, let's, um, we're working mostly with square edges. Think you're giving up your day job, Moose? No? I'll cut all four while we're here. I tried to do this for a living, for 11 years. Styrofoam furniture. It just, just it wouldn't float. So, if you've ever wondered why furniture making is such a tough business, can you imagine what it would cost to go through the design process? You have to be a lot faster than I am to make an original piece of furniture for somebody. It's just a, uh, it's almost a no win. No, you're going to pull the legs. Yeah, in. I am. I'm, 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 so I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to turn this upside down and work on it. I'm just working on this one corner. Maybe we can do it like this. So 
Now you you should uh, you can think you can look at this and say okay well, we should leave the same amount of reveal here as here. We don't necessarily have to do that if we want those outside pieces to just hang over. So what I'm going to do is set that there and then down here. Didn't want that to move. So let's bring that in all of three inches. So if we take six inches off the length of this, six inches off of that is going to be 28. So I need my apron to be 28. Well, that was almost where we were. And we came in, so then, uh, where are we here? We came in three inches from there. I don't want to come in three inches on the front and back. So let's go two inches there. So four inches from 15 is 11. How's our time? How many? All right, let's assemble this. Uh, how much of a reveal do we want? Let's go half an inch, which is what these happen to be. Easiest way to do it. Superman fingers. Questions, Frick? Nope. Negative comments? Several. <laughs> Seriously? No. <laughs> Someone was saying they liked the name McLaren, and I was explaining that my all my sons are named after cars. And then someone at, was wondering if I had a girl, if I'd name her Tesla. And you said? I said no. Her initials will be BMW. But that's not going to happen, so. You never know, Frick. True. Erica could be talked into her. Okay, so there's our, there's our two ends. Now let's put that one apron. Now we're going to do this. Set this down. I'm, I'm hurrying, but as you can see, you can be really fast with this. So what would take you days to do with wood, building with styrofoam, so at least you can get conceptualize and get what you uh, or develop an idea. I miss this. I don't miss the uh, no money, but I miss the creative part of woodworking. What were the odds? I, I, I had no idea where that other one is, and when I put the nail in, I hit the nail. On the head. On the head. Actually, it was on the shaft of the other one. Okay. I didn't need that back one. Okay. Uh, this end, we did. So, we talked about... Oh, I thought we had a three-inch overhang, Jake. How'd you screw that up? Huh? Well, we can move it.
Well, let's just focus on this end. Let's pull this down so we actually... How did we screw up that math? It's you a team cut, effort, by the way. You never cut the apron. Yeah, I did. I took it over and cut it. I thought... Thanks for speaking up, Moose. <laughs> I got you a microphone for a reason. Okay, so ignore that end and just look at this end. Eh. Um, I don't like the. I don't like the. Uh... Ken, comments. Would you consider yourself an amateur woodworker? So just now, ignore this end. Obviously, just focusing on that end. Are we getting anywhere? What about the leg? Should the, does the leg need taper or or does the square leg fit? If if everything is rectilinear, which is what this is, although we did introduce a bevel on the underside of the table, then you kind of have to stay with it. You can't mix a lot of curves with with uh, rectangular pieces and have it look right. I was I mean at one point I thought we could put an arc in here, but then that that really wouldn't fit unless we kind of did that somewhere else. The audience wants an arc. Yeah? yeah. The, the apron looks clunky. You think? Too much? Yes. Too big? Too big. You so actually, can you actually put holes or shape in it? In the apron? I mean, it may not fit with that. But yeah, but I, I, was, I, would, I would probably introduce a drawer to this somewhere. And this is pretty standard fare. I mean, there's, there's nothing too different about this. And I want to reiterate, what we're trying to do is just go through the process of how do you develop these ideas? How do you take it from a concept into a piece of furniture? And I'm suggesting work with styrofoam because you can readily change it, pull out some nails, take the piece off, start over. So have we got time? How much time do we have? Let we me, don't have enough time. No, let me read some comments though. They're saying Sorry. that the apron is too wide or too deep. The overhang is too much. The overhang is too much, which is what I thought actually. Um, they want you to taper the legs. Well, you see, so you know what? When I was doing this for a living, I never looked at anybody else's furniture. I never looked at any uh, furniture books. I stayed away from it because I did not want to cloud my thinking with other stuff that had already been done. So I dare say you're being influenced by that other table that you saw. But, and, you know, in saying all this, this there really isn't a whole lot of uh, latitude here in doing something like this if you're going to stay within this concept of a, of a hall table with a rectangular top and four legs. I would, if I was, had the time to develop this, I'm, as I said earlier, I think I would take this from having any legs and I would make just a base that attaches to the wall, which would certainly make it easier for whoever vacuums in my house to vacuum and keep clean underneath it. But if we go back to your comments, we can we can put an arc in here. I don't think that would work. We could we could we could make it uh, a little narrower. At six inches, we would come back down to five. Everyone wants you to continue this next time. Really? So you you want if you if you want we will uh, we'll go on from there. That'll give me two weeks to think about it and we'll come up with some more ideas. What do you think, Ken? <laughs> Now, I just moved that in. So, Jake, I want you to come over here and focus on that one corner and see if that did anything. It's kind of getting that, I used to call it country contemporary look. So, I, but don't, don't catch that in just in this. From, from my perspective right here is what I want, what I want you to do. Oh, I got it. You know what I forgot? The rosewood. That's what I want to do. I need, I, need, uh, I need a couple of minutes, Frick, so tell me when I've got... Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause yeah. We still All right. The we will. We will uh, at your request, and you got to give me. You got to give me a few more yays and possibly some nays. I, I'm gonna. I go back and read all the comments. If you want us to continue along this furniture design process on the next episode, please let me know. Now, look at this. Yes, there's a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. Good. Oh, good. We'll get two weeks of this. At least. Yeah, We're here. We aim, to, we aim to please. <laughs> How are our donations doing? Um, we are at 2,325. So we're close to a fifth giveaway. Come on, guys. Take care of it. Okay, first of all, you need to come over here and see this. So 
Uh, I have a really good, we have a really good friend down in Southern California, Ahmed. And uh, Ahmed's our, uh, our wood guy. So Ahmed, is, he, he sources some of the most incredible wood. This is all going to be turned into saw handles because I'm out of production in the shop, on the shop floor, at the end of this month, supposedly. And then my time will be spent developing new tools and making the custom saws. So here's what he sent me, some figured koa. Quarters. This is figured quarters on koa. This wood is native to Hawaii. In fact, I don't think it's grown anywhere else. This will be incredible. This is madrone, uh, madrone burl, and that, you can't see it like in the like that nearly as much. I don't know if you can see the figure, but that will light up incredibly. What I'm really excited about is this, and this is some of the nicest Macassar ebony that I've seen in a long time. That will make incredible handles. Here's some English walnut that is incredible, that absolutely stunning figure in it. If you can see that, with just a little bit of heartwood, we'll catch that maybe in the horns on the top of the saw. This is uh, Bastogne walnut. I got quite a bit of it. And it has, that's about as highly figured as you're going to get, if you can see all of that uh, rippling figure in there. Look at this piece in particular. And that will just light up once there's a, it's polished up with a finish on it. Some Kingwood. I love Kingwood. It has a, a a purplish hue with some sapwood in it, and we'll always make sure we get that sapwood in there. Several pieces. This is, we've had this for a while. This is Paduk. This is our Vera wood, Dave's stash. And the other thing he sent me was this, and this is snake wood. And that weighs, what does that weigh? Five pounds? Four kilograms. Four kilograms, thank you. This is king wood, or snake wood. So that's the first time I've had snake wood that was. Uh, no flaws yes. and suitable for. Oh, what about the gaboon? Where's the gaboon? Oh, down here. Yeah, and there you got some gaboon ebony with a little bit of, a little bit of sap, white sap in it. Actually, that's not sap. It's not in the right place to be sap. There's some desert ironwood, and that makes, that makes gorgeous handles, and it's so rugged. It's so that's that piece of schedule. I have, I have yet to finish it. Oh, so much wood, so little time. But here's the story of the day. What was his name? A vet. He Mike was a uh, Marine, Mike. Decker, yeah. Mike Decker from New York. So I had some conversations with Mike on the phone. And Mike said, Rob, I got something for you. He said, I want to donate this to the Purple Heart. So what this is, this is Brazilian rosewood. Now, before you freak out, we have the papers. We have the papers because when the embargo was placed on Brazilian rosewood, <coughs> it became illegal to um, export anything with Brazilian rosewood. If you remember the story from a, 10 years or so ago where a couple of the big guitar companies got in a lot of trouble and it was all about uh, trading in woods that had had an embargo placed. So the embargo stated that you had to be able to prove that this wood was harvested before the embargo. That's what the paperwork does. So that means we will be able to make this and turn this into handles, auction it off on the PHB to fundraise for the Purple Heart. And uh, one, two, three, four, if we're lucky, we might get five handles out of it. This stuff has the, it has the most unique smell. We got a little bit of color in there. This is going to be something that will be uh, epic. He also sent me a bunch of other scraps and there's, we may be able to get another another handle out of it. So big thank you to Mike. This is absolutely awesome. Uh, I can't even begin to tell you what that piece of wood would be worth if it was for sale. Okay. Where are we? Draw time. Draw time? Yep. So everyone has had the opportunity. I'm going to one last one last uh, look at the prizes. We're giving away mallets. Two of them are cherry, resin impregnated. This one is maple resin impregnated, slight flaws, no flaw uh, affects the function. We've got several um, Kerfex 10s. That's I would not cut half blind dovetails without a Kerfex 10. Though I have minor flaws, fully functional. We have we're giving away the captain is always right hoodie with the I'm a, I, and I'm the captain on the hood. We're giving away the incredible warm dead cat sweater, the naughty girl. And the uh, 
the captain, the captain, uh, by, by, thank you, Moose, I was stuttering, the Canada sweater, uh, those are given away, and then we're going to give away one of these for every $500 in donations. Don't forget your maple syrup either. Somewhere we have it stashed here. And our maple butter. All right. Oh, uh, we didn't talk about... I'm not allowed to. All right. Are you ready? We're at 2735. $2, if somebody, If somebody wants to add 250 to the donation pile, we will throw in one more... One more... Charlie uh, Oh, was it Charlie? Thank you, Charlie. All right, we ready? What are we going for first? Uh, well, let's give away our let's give away our garments first. Let's give away. Let's start off with Frick's favorite, the Naughty Girl. Mm -hmm. Tonight's Naughty Girl is, is Mark Corso in Plant City, Florida. Congratulations, Mark, Mark. Let us know what size you are. Uh huh. Next is the captain. Is all no? Let's go. Let's go with the Canada. Hockey sweater. Canada hockey sweater goes to Kevin Moore in Where? the United States. He didn't put what state. but Congratulations, Kevin. Let us know your size. Let's do Captain is Always Right. Big thank you to Moose for this. Don't forget Pat's Secret Garden and the dead cats are on sale at a substantial savings. you got to get one. And make sure the person that you love he gets one as well. Captain is Always Right. Yep. Captain is uh, Anij Stewart in Alberta. Hey. Congratulations, Anish. Who's getting the dead cat tonight? Tonight's dead cat is Brian Graham in Missouri. Yes. Congratulations, Brian. <laughs> what? You pronounced it right? You're no, it's M-O. So and it's you didn't know it was Missouri, huh? Well. Good thing you got Megan here. Uh, Not it was between Missouri and Mississippi. And Massachusetts. <laughs> okay. okay. Our, did we go over 3,000? Okay, so we're giving away five. How do you want to? How do you want to do? What should we do, Moose? All right, Moose, Ken, sorry. Three, three and two. Three Kerfex ends, two mallets. Yeah. You want to do the two cherry mallets? Yeah. Hey, wait, wait, wait. What? Oh, and we're still gonna do the frame too. Oh yeah, right, the frame. Forgot. We'll do that last. Okay, let's do a cherry, a cherry resin impregnated cherry mallet. First cherry mallet is going to Benjamin Arrow. And, and a big thank you to Gina, by the way. Gina and uh, Pam, who do all of our packaging. And Gina hunts down everybody's names to find out they get the right, uh, the right size. And, yeah, these gals are extremely busy. And thank you to you folks for doing that, keeping ben them busy. Benjamin Arrow in Ottawa is getting the... Benjamin in Ottawa. Mallet's on your way, brother. Congratulations. Uh, let's do a uh, Curve X10 next. Curve X10 is going to Jim Whitehouse in Guelphs, Ontario, Canada. Wow. A lot of Canadians tonight. Jim, congratulations. Next cherry mallet. Next mallet goes to Greg Sansolo in New York. Hey, Greg, congratulations. Next, Curve X10. Tracy Clark in Ontario. Oh my God. If you could rig this. I No. No. Tracy, congratulations. And the final Curve X10 goes to Lloyd Satchel in London, United Kingdom. Hey, Lloyd. Congratulations. Way across the pond. All right. Are we going to call it the grand prize? Sure. I suppose I like it. I wanted to keep it. It was Jake's idea to give it away. Too bad. So this is, I'll tell you one more time, this is the frame that we made in the latest YouTube we did on making picture frames. The whole idea was how to make a perfect miter using the new miter shooting boards that Harold Snodgrass, Harold came, started working with us about a year ago, Ken? And Harold spent almost all of his week making shooting boards. He does an incredible job, and we got it. it this was tough because those miter shooting boards had to be spot on so you would get a true 45, and that's a lot harder than you would think. But you learn how to sharpen a plane, your second shooting board purchase should be a miter shooting board or the mini. And that's what the video was about. So this is a framed picture of a, a catalog, a page out of Lee Nelson catalog back in 2004. Calendar. Calendar. And that was the, uh, 
that was the uh, prop that I did for them. Who's it going to? Tonight's grand prize. We'll, is we'll sign it and date it. West Brown and Bowling Green, Kentucky. Hey, Wes, congratulations. The final salute to Herman and John, our two World War II combat vets that uh, were featured on our classes. And uh, everybody, I keep getting these people that said, Rob, those guys, I got, a Chris, I got a thank you card. Those guys. So we sent out all kinds of Christmas cards to them, and they took the time to send everybody a thank you card, which was unbelievable and so much appreciated. They were, uh, Ken, uh, Ted, uh, Ted came to me in uh, hockey's on, on uh, Tuesday and said, Robbie said, Decca, he sent me a card. <laughs> they were thrilled. Thank you, folks. Appreciate your support of the Purple Heart Project. Special salute to all of our combat wounded veterans. Remember, if you live in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, or Newfoundland, and you would like to attend, if you're a combat wounded vet, please apply. If you are a civilian and would like one of the civilian spots, contact us at support at robcosman.com, and I'll be in touch with you ASAP. Have a great weekend. See you in two weeks. We're, gonna, we're going to go back to work on our uh, hall table. Cheers.